Life on the Mississippi, Chapter 38. Chapter 38. The House Beautiful. We took passage in a Cincinnati boat for New Orleans, or on a Cincinnati boat either is correct, the former is the eastern form of putting it, the latter the western. Mr. Dickens declined to agree that the Mississippi steamboats were magnificent, or that they were floating palaces, terms which had always been applied to them. Terms which did not over-express the admiration with which the people viewed them. Mr. Dickens's position was unassailable, possibly, the people's position was certainly unassailable. If Mr. Dickens was comparing these boats with the crown jewels, or with the Taj, or with the Matterhorn, or with some other priceless or wonderful thing which he had seen, they were not magnificent he was right. The people compared them with what they had seen. And, thus measured, thus judged, the boats were magnificent the term was the correct one, it was not at all too strong. The people were as right as was Mr. Dickens. The steamboats were finer than anything on shore. Compared with superior dwelling houses and first-class hotels in the valley, they were indubitably magnificent, they were palaces. To a few people living in New Orleans and St. Louis, they were not magnificent, perhaps. Not palaces. But to the great majority of those populations, and to the entire population spread over both banks between Baton Rouge and St. Louis, they were palaces. They tallied with the citizen's dream of what magnificence was, and satisfied it. Every town and village along that vast stretch of double river frontage had a best dwelling, finest dwelling, mansion, the home of its wealthiest and most conspicuous citizen. It is easy to describe it. Large grassy yard, with paling fence painted white in fair repair, brick walk from gate to door. Big, square, two-story frame house, painted white and porticoed like a Grecian temple. With this difference, that the imposing fluted columns and Corinthian capitals were a pathetic sham, being made of white pine, and painted, iron knocker, brass door knob. Discolored, for lack of polishing. Within, an uncarpeted hall, of plain boards, opening out of it, a parlor, 15 feet by 15 in some instances 5 or 10 feet larger, in grain carpet. Mahogany center table, lamp on it, with green paper shade standing on a gridiron, so to speak, made of high-colored yarns, by the young ladies of the house, and called a lamp mat. Several books, piled and disposed, with cast iron exactness, according to an inherited and unchangeable plan, among them, Tupper, much penciled. Also, friendship's offering, and, affection's wreath, with their sapienities illustrated in dire way mezzotints, also, Ossian. Alonzo and Melissa, maybe Ivanhoe, also album, full of original poetry of the thou hast wounded the spirit that loved thee breed, two or three goody-goody works. Shepherd of Salisbury Plain, etc. A current number of the chaste and innocuous Godies ladies book, with painted fashion plate of wax figure women with mouths all alike. Lips and eyelids the same size each five-foot woman with a two-inch wedge sticking from under her dress and letting on to be half of her foot. Polished air-tight stove, new and deadly invention, with pipe passing through a board which closes up the discarded good old fireplace. On each end of the wooden mantel, over the fireplace, a large basket of peaches and other fruits, natural size, all done in plaster, rudely, or in wax, and painted to resemble the originals. Which they don't. Over middle of mantel, engraving Washington crossing the Delaware, on the wall by the door, copy of it done in thunder and lightning cruels by one of the young ladies. Work of art which would have made Washington hesitate about crossing, if he could have foreseen what advantage was going to be taken of it. Piano kettle in disguise. With music, bound and unbound, piled on it, and on a stand nearby. Battle of Prague. Bird waltz. Arkansas traveler. Rosin the bow. Marseille hymn. On a lone barren isle, St. Helena. The last link is broken. She wore a wreath of roses the night when last we met. Go, forget me, why should sorrow o'er that brow a shadow fling? Hours there were to memory dearer. Long, long ago. Days of absence. A life on the ocean wave, a home on the rolling deep. Bird at sea. And spread open on the rack, where the plaintive singer has left it, row hol on, silver muhoon, guide the travel lure his way, etc. tilted pensively against the piano, a guitar. Guitar capable of playing the Spanish fandango by itself, if you give it a start. Frantic work of art on the wall. Pious motto, done on the premises, sometimes in colored yarns, sometimes in faded grasses. Progenitor of the God bless our home of modern commerce. 
Framed in black mouldings on the wall, other works of arts, conceived and committed on the premises, by the young ladies, being grim black and white crayons. Landscapes, mostly, lake, solitary sailboat, petrified clouds, pre-geological trees on shore, anthracite precipice, name of criminal conspicuous in the corner. Lithograph, Napoleon crossing the Alps. Lithograph, the grave at St. Helena. Steel plates, Trumbull's Battle of Bunker Hill, and the Sally from Gibraltar. Copper plates, Moses smiting the rock, and return of the prodigal son. In big gilt frame, slander of the family in oil, papa holding a book, Constitution of the United States. Guitar leaning against mama, blue ribbons fluttering from its neck. The young ladies, as children, in slippers and scallop pantlets, one embracing toy horse, the other beguiling kitten with ball of yarn, and both simpering up at mama, who simpers back. These persons all fresh, raw, and red apparently skinned. Opposite, in gilt frame, grandpa and grandma, at thirty and twenty-two, stiff, old-fashioned, high-collared, puff-sleeved, glaring pallidly out from a background of solid Egyptian night. Under a glass French clock dome, large bouquet of stiff flowers done in corpsey white wax. Pyramidal whatnot in the corner, the shelves occupied chiefly with bric-a-brac of the period, disposed with an eye to best effect, shell, with the Lord's Prayer carved on it. Another shell. Of the long oval sort, narrow, straight orifice, three inches long, running from end to end portrait of Washington carved on it. Not well done, the shell had Washington's mouth, originally. Artists should have built to that. These two are memorials of the long ago bridal trip to New Orleans and the French market. Other bric a brac. Californian specimens. Quartz, with gold watered hearing. Old Guinea gold locket, with circlet of ancestral hair in it. Indian arrow heads, of flint. Pair of bead moccasins, from uncle who crossed the plains. Three alum baskets of various colors being skeleton frame of wire, clothed on with cubes of crystallized alum in the rock candy style works of art which were achieved by the young ladies. Their doubles and duplicates to be found upon all whatnots in the land, convention of desiccated bugs and butterflies pinned to a card, painted toy dog, seated upon bellows attachment. Drops its under jaw and squeaks when pressed upon. Sugar candy rabbit limbs and features merged together, not strongly defined, pewter presidential campaign medal. Miniature cardboard wood sawyer, to be attached to the stove pipe and operated by the heat, small Napoleon, done in wax. Spread open daguerreotypes of dim children, parents, cousins, aunts, and friends, in all attitudes but customary ones. No templed portico at back, and manufactured landscape stretching away in the distance that came in later, with the photograph. All these vague figures lavishly chained and ringed. Metal indicated and secured from doubt by stripes and splashes of vivid gold bronze. All of them too much combed, too much fixed up. And all of them uncomfortable in inflexible Sunday clothes of a pattern which the spectator cannot realize could ever have been in fashion, husband and wife generally grouped together. Husband sitting, wife standing, with hand on his shoulder and both preserving, all these fading years, some traceable effect of the daguerreotypist's brisk, now smile, if you please. Bracketed over what not place of special sacredness and outrage in water color, done by the young niece that came on a visit long ago, and died. Pity, too. For she might have repented of this in time. Horse hair chairs, horse hair sofa which keeps sliding from under you. Window shades, of oil stuff, with milk maids and ruined castles stenciled on them in fierce colors. Lambrequins dependent from gaudy boxings of beaten tin, gilded. Bedrooms with rag carpets. Bedsteads of the corded sort, with a sag in the middle, the cords needing tightening, snuffy feather bed not aired often enough. Cane seat chairs, splint bottomed rocker. Looking glass on wall, school slate size, veneered frame, inherited bureau. Wash bowl and pitcher, possibly but not certainly, brass candlestick, tallow candle, snuffers. Nothing else in the room. Not a bathroom in the house, and no visitor likely to come along who has ever seen one. That was the residence of the principal citizen, all the way from the suburbs of New Orleans to the edge of St. Louis. When he stepped aboard a big fine steamboat, he entered a new and marvelous world. Chimney tops cut to counterfeit a spraying crown of plumes and may be painted red. Pilot house, hurricane deck, boiler deck guards, all garnished with white wooden filigree work of fanciful patterns, gilt acorns topping the derricks. Gilt deer horns over the big bell. 
gaudy symbolical picture on the paddle box, possibly, big roomy boiler deck, painted blue, and furnished with Windsor armchairs, inside, a far-receding snow-white cabin. Porcelain knob and oil picture on every stateroom door. Curving patterns of filigree work touched up with gilding, stretching overhead all down the converging vista. Big chandeliers every little way, each an April shower of glittering glass drops, lovely rainbow light falling everywhere from the colored glazing of the skylights. The whole a long-drawn, resplendent tunnel, a bewildering and soul-satisfying spectacle. In the ladies' cabin a pink and white Wilton carpet, as soft as mush, and glorified with a ravishing pattern of gigantic flowers. Then the bridal chamber. The animal that invented that idea was still alive and unhanged, at that day. Bridal chamber whose pretentious flummery was necessarily overawing to the now tottering intellect of that Hosannahing citizen. Every stateroom had its couple of cozy clean bunks, and perhaps a looking glass and a snug closet. And sometimes there was even a washbowl and pitcher, and part of a towel which could be told from mosquito netting by an expert. Though generally these things were absent, and the shirt-sleeved passengers cleansed themselves at a long row of stationary bowls in the barber shop, where were also public towels, public combs, and public soap. Take the steamboat which I have just described, and you have her in her highest and finest, and most pleasing, and comfortable, and satisfactory estate. Now cake her over with a layer of ancient and obdurate dirt, and you have the Cincinnati steamer a while ago referred to. Not all over only inside. For she was ably officered in all departments except the stewards. But wash that boat and repaint her, and she would be about the counterpart of the most complimented boat of the old flush times, for the steamboat architecture of the West has undergone no change. Neither has steamboat furniture and ornamentation undergone any.